Hey y'all, and welcome back to our series on procedural generation basics or procedural generation for beginners. I'm Matt Mirafish. In this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at preventing overlaps when spawning objects. So in a previous video in the series on spawning objects using raycasts, we ran into some issues where we would spawn our robots and they would be overlapping and clipping into each other, which for something like a character or a tree or a house is really not gonna look right. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna look in this video at how we can spawn things without overlapping. So here we have an example. I'm attempting to spawn 10 of these robots, but we're actually ending up with less because we're spawning using a non-overlap approach. Now, of course, you could have a loop that checks to make sure you've spawned the desired number before it gives up, right? There's a few ways you can do that. I'm not gonna address that in this system. I'm just gonna keep it simple and just say, hey, check to see if we can spawn into this space because it's free. If not, give up because there's something already there and then continue spawning. What we've got is I've added this Raycast Aligner No Overlap script, and I will make this small project available for you guys to download so you can just grab the source yourself directly. You don't have to type it off the screen. I'll also paste uh, links to the scripts in the description. I've left a couple of debug log statements in here. Usually I kind of delete those out when I deploy my code, but I actually think in this case, it may be useful for you, right? As you're experimenting and debugging. So I've decided to leave those in. It shows a little bit of the process. So what we're doing here is once we spawn this object, we have a function called position raycast. This is just a kind of a adapted copy of the Raycast aligner script. We're gonna call that. We declare a Raycast hit struct, which is gonna store information about what the Raycast hit. Then we call physics.raycast nested into an if statement. So if physics.raycast doesn't hit anything, this following block of code will not be executed. Uh, but if it does, we'll move on to generating a spawn rotation. We're using hit.normal again, right? This is the same as in our Raycast placement. Now here's where things get new on line 27. We're declaring a vector three, which is called overlap test box scale. And we're just making it equal in all directions to this public float variable overlap test box size. And in this case, it's gonna be a box with a scale of one here in each axis, right? X, Y, and Z, the same value. Of course, you could do unique dimensions if you wanted to. Then we're declaring a collider array, an array of colliders called colliders inside overlap box. We're setting that to equal a new collider array with a length of one. Now this is because I only need to find one collider before I give up, right? I could make it more if I wanted to check all the different colliders. But in this case, if any collider is there, I'm gonna abort the mission. Here then we have an integer called the number of colliders found and we set it to equal physics.overlapbox non-alloc. Now what this is, you can use the regular physics overlap box and that will return a new array of colliders. I like to use this overlap box non-alloc because it doesn't allocate memory for the garbage collector. Obviously this is a little micro demo, it doesn't matter, but in a real game, garbage allocations can be a real problem. And so making you aware of these physics dot, you know, sphere cast non-alloc, and there are a bunch of them, a bunch of physics functions that don't allocate. So I just wanted to make you aware of that and, and I sort of think it's best practice if you're doing lots of these kind of operations to not allocate garbage when you can avoid it. And actually, when I think about it, I probably should declare the collider out of the function, right? So we're not making a new array every time, but anyway. Then we're going to check at hit.point. We're going to cast a box based on the test box scale, right? On this variable that we created. We're gonna pass in a reference to the array, say, okay, this is the array to store the results into, the boxes, the colliders that you found inside the box. We're gonna pass in our spawn rotation so that our box is oriented correctly, right? There could be some weird results if the box was rotated differently from the item we're trying to check. I'm not sure if it's so important, but I, I did it anyway. And then very important here, the spawned object layer. So this is a layer mask variable. 
We've declared it as public in the inspector. And this allows us to say, what layer are we checking against here, right? I don't want to detect the ground and then abort, right? I want to only detect other robots or other objects of the type that I'm spawning. Then I've got a debug log statement here just to check the number of colliders found, right? And this was because I was having some confusion because the objects were getting spawned in start and there was an order of operation issue. You'll notice I moved my pick and spawn function into this script so that I could make sure that it was happening when I wanted it to. So this was part of my debugging process, but I figured I would leave it there just so you guys can see what the debugging looks like and, and maybe you'll find it useful. Of course, you can just delete it or comment it out if you don't need it. So then we check if the number of colliders found is equal to zero, right? Meaning nothing is there in that one unit, which is usually one meter in Unity. In that one unit box, there were no other colliders on the layer mask specified. In this case, it's the layer robot, right? There's no other colliders on the layer robot. Then I put in this debug log just to say, okay, we spawned a robot, we were successful. Uh, really, it should have been actually down in this function, but anyway. And then I call the pick uh, function. And pa I'm passing in hit dot point, which is the position to spawn and the spawn rotation. So I just gave this function two arguments, a vector three called position to spawn and a quaternion rotation to spawn, right? And that's just so I can pass these values that we've calculated with the raycast into this pick function. All this pick function does is generate a random index, right? A random number between zero and the length of items to pick from. I also moved my items to pick from array of random objects into this script before I had it in a separate script because it was going from start, it wasn't happening at the right time. And so it wasn't detecting that the robots had already been spawned. So I combined it all together here. And then we're just declaring a new game object variable called clone and instantiating based on the random index, right? And I covered how to do this in the other video. Now we're kind of tying it all together in a little bit of a more robust system where we can test for overlaps and then spawn when none are detected. So let's just take a look at what that looks like in practice. So here, here's our Raycast Aligner No Overlap component. We have our two items to pick from, right? Roboto Yellow, Roboto Red. Importantly, I set Roboto Red, which is the master prefab, onto the robot layer, right? Very important, right? So that his capsule collider and all his other colliders uh, can be detected. And because he's the master prefab and Roboto Yellow is a variant that automatically put Roboto Yellow. And I did all the sub, all the child objects as well, set them to that layer. So now in our item spreader, we are gonna pick one of these prefabs in the pick function. The raycast distance that we're casting down is still 100, that's fine. And the overlap test box size is three. So this is kind of the, the important variable as far as this tutorial is concerned. Uh, and then of course, we're only checking the robot layer, right? We're not checking, we're not gonna detect the ground with our box cast. We're only gonna detect other robots. So I'm spawning into an area that's 10 by 10, right? As determined by my item spreader, it's 10 on the X and 10 on the Z. It's a 10 by 10 area. I'm gonna go ahead and let's set this overlap test box size to nine. What we're gonna see then when we do that is that now we are gonna spawn, in this case, only three, right? And these are guys who kind of spawned on the edges. So they're far enough from the others to get spawned. I think it's possible that if we set this to, let's say 11, right? Which is larger, then we'll only spawn one or two in this case because the distance is large enough. Let's say if we set it to 50, we should only spawn one, right? Where the only the first one will spawn. And then yeah, the other ones are like, oh, nope, there's no space for me because there's a, I'm trying to check a box with a size of 50 to see if there's space and there isn't. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you could loop and do a counter of the number of successfully spawned ones. So you make sure you always spawn a certain number. But as we start to get into this kind of testing for overlaps, you can get into situations where you spawn less because there's not space to spawn the full number, right? And then if we go down to uh, a size of one, we can see, right, that they're all spawned nicely without clipping into each other. So that is how you spawn items 
without overlapping. You can also check out physics overlap sphere. I think there's a physics overlap capsule. It's all documented in the scripting API. You can do some other overlap checks, but this is a great way to place objects without overlapping aligned with the terrain in a procedural environment. So hopefully you found this video helpful. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun making these. I'm gonna try to keep the series going for as long as I can come up with new ideas. If you have a request for a new idea, drop a comment. That will be really interesting for me to see what you all are interested in learning. If you're finding these videos valuable, please consider subscribing uh, and adding a like to the video. That helps me a lot. And thanks again for watching.